Let's now move into specifics on how aphids actually may affect uh, our crops, how they feed and how they might damage uh, the kinds of things that we're trying to produce. So there are various kinds of things that aphids might do. Sometimes it's just contaminating the produce just by being there. Uh, they may reduce the vigor from results of heavy sustained episodes of feeding. I want to talk a little about honeydew. Some of them are going to cause the leaves to curl and there are a couple of cases, although not a lot that are important regionally, where they are vectors of viruses that are uh, producing disease in plants. But a lot of times, if we're talking about uh, vegetables in particular, the main issue with aphids is just they're there. They may not be particularly damaging, or they may, but they're just on the part of the plant that we're trying to sell, and, and that is unacceptable. So in this case, uh, in the upper left, I've got a picture of what we call the red lettuce aphid, or the uh, lettuce currant aphid, uh, and it's quite conspicuous aphid that if it does occur on, on lettuce is, is visible. Cabbage aphids on a lot of kinds of brassicas are one of the more important kinds of aphids that regularly occurs contaminants on produce that we may try to market. So cabbage aphid, if there is one aphid that is probably the number one issue in this part of the country uh, in terms of being on parts of plants that we don't want them to be on when we're trying to sell it, it would be cabbage aphid. And it would be on cabbage, it could be in collards, it could be in Brussels sprouts. Um, again, any any of the brassicas are susceptible to this species. And it is one of the more difficult ones for us to manage. The lettuce infesting aphids, again, because this is a leafy vegetable, are ones that are pretty conspicuous and ones that there's fairly low tolerance for. And there are four species of aphids that might be associated with lettuce. But in particular, the current lettuce aphid, that red lettuce aphid, or uh, one that is in the upper left here that's uh, associated with lettuce family plants. And occasionally, although people less commonly notice it, uh, uh, we might see root aphids on, say, uh, garden beets. The issue I think most people consider with aphids is they're doing some sort of damage through their feeding. So uh, are they damaging? Well, they can be if there's a lot of aphids and they are feeding for a long period of time uh, and uh, it is sustained, then you might see effects from this, from the, the loss of the plant fluids uh, in the form of leaf yellowing, premature senescence, uh, maybe wilting. So sustained feeding by high populations of aphids can produce many symptoms. If they occur over a long period of time, uh, they're more likely to occur if the plant has some sort of drought stress situation, but less so if they don't. However, it is important to recognize that aphids are under enormous amounts of natural control outdoors, and often uh, these kinds of natural enemies will be affecting control before they do serious damage to the plants. So things like surfed fly larvae in the upper left, uh, like a lady beetle on the right, uh, or a lacewing larva on the lower part of this picture. And it is an important uh, consideration that even if you have a lot of aphids, that does not always translate to the plant actually being damaged. Plants can tolerate the removal of fluids by aphids in many cases because it is a fairly benign kind of feeding. Yes, they are removing fluids, they're removing uh, some of the nutrients, but at the same time, the way they're doing this is in a way that uh, causes minimal damage to the plants in, in many cases. So, getting back to you know the whole way that aphids feed, um, some insects chew and, and aphids on the right feed by sucking mouth parts, piercing sucking mouth parts. So the way that they feed are with the mandibles and the maxillae uh, being in the form of very elongate stylets which penetrate into the plant and allow them to remove fluids. These then penetrate and in the case of aphids ultimately reach the phloem. Uh, and they do this in a very careful way. Uh, they do this in a way uh, that uh, allows them to then pull up fluid from the phloem for a very extended period of time. So here we have an aphid and she's on the surface of the leaf and there's her 
rostrum with the mouth parts uh, in the middle. You can't see them in this picture, but uh, she's on the surface. The mouth parts then extend into the plant. And in this picture on the right, if you can wrap your head around this, uh, so the, the on the picture on the right, you, you see the, the aphid, you see the rostrum, uh, and, and then uh, just above where that arrow shows is where the mouth parts are extending through the leaf surface. Uh, and it's a very narrow track. It often goes between uh, individual cells, and ultimately, if it reaches the uh, site where they are trying to reach, the phloem, uh, then they will uh, then open up and then remove fluids. But many aphids will not do any severe structural damage during this feeding process. They want to find a feeding site that allows them to stay there for sometimes the rest of their life and continue to remove fluids. So they are going to uh, feed with the kind of uh, feeding uh, pattern that uh, allows for uh, really precision drilling and then they open it up at the, the tip and then can pull out the fluids uh, without doing local cell damage. So here's the little mouth parts. Again, there's the maxillae on the right uh, in the middle and the mandibles on the outside. So you can see a mandible go in on B, another mandible go in on C, the maxillae follow, and they make a little track into the uh, surface of the plant, ultimately plumbing into the phloem. So, again, a precise way of feeding. And as a result, uh, again, you can have a lot of aphids uh, on a plant and you may not see any uh, obvious effect on, on plant growth because all they're doing is removing some of the fluids, uh, maybe some of the excess nutrients uh, uh, or, or nutrients that the plant uh, may not need for, for growth, uh, some of the excess uh, uh, sugars. if you have high numbers for a long period of time you will see damage. Another issue with aphids uh, that you see is that the material they're feeding on, this sugary material from the, the phloem, uh, results in a waste product called honeydew. And honeydew is a, a fluid that is excreted by aphids and some other insects that feed in this way that uh, is sugary, uh, it is sweet, uh, and uh, sticky and sometimes it is an issue in and of itself. And it's also a very useful diagnostic. So in this case, we see several aphids uh, on a leaf of a plant. By the way, the, the ones that are unusually black have been parasitized, but most of them have not. But what I'm trying to show in this picture is the little droplets of fluid, and that's the honeydew that is being secreted uh, by the, or excreted by these, these aphids. So what you'll see uh, with the uh, honeydew producing insects such as aphids are, are small droplets that have dropped from below the point where they're feeding uh, and uh, these will be in the form of a sweet sticky droplet. So they're again feeding on the phloem on the left but uh, most of what they're going to be ultimately excreting is going to be uh, the excess water and sugar because the flow material is not a very nutrient rich source of, of material other than the sugars. So most of it gets expelled out the hind end is what we call honeydew. And honeydew can be a very useful diagnostic, uh, particularly in indoor, indoor grown plants. Uh, so in the picture here on the upper left is a, is a, a pepper leaf and what attracted my attention to this was originally the little uh, shiny droplets which were the honeydew. I did also see the little uh, white material uh, that's also indicated on this. You look up, you look above, and then what you'll see is the insect that produced this. Uh, in the lower right is the aphids that were on the, the leaf above the pepper leaf. So honeydew is a very useful diagnostic for telling if an an insect that is feeding on the phloem, and often it's, an often it's an aphid, is present. And there are other insects that produce honeydew. Uh, all of them are in the order Hemiptera. All of them are ones that feed on the phloem, and that's a subset of those that are in the order 
uh, Hemiptera. So if you see honeydew, it's usually produced by an aphid. Another group that's common are soft scales, and that, that involves, uh, between those two, almost all the honeydew producers we have in this part of the world. But there are other honeydew producing insects, white flies, mealybugs, some of the psyllids, some of the leaf hoppers. So honeydew, if you see it, would be the result of the waste material being produced by some kind of sap sucking phloem feeding member of the insect order Hemiptera, mealybugs, soft scales, white flies, psyllids, and aphids. Rarely indoors, much more commonly outdoors on ornamental plants, we also see a, an association of a fungus with honeydew production. Uh, and that is sooty molds. Sooty molds are fungi that grow on honeydew contaminated surfaces. Wherever honeydew is allowed to land and persist, it can support the growth of these dark growing uh, fungi called sooty molds. And these are not fungi that are pathogens. They are fungi instead that just grow on the honeydew itself. Uh, but they may cause the surface to be uh, discolored. Uh, because of the, the uh, gray growth of the fungus, they may interfere some with the photosynthesis on the plant surface and uh, may degrade the quality if we're trying to market something that has honeydew, particularly honeydew with sooty mold on it. Another thing that we see with honeydew, and this is not uncommon in gardens, is you're going to see ants uh, collecting it. Uh, there are a great many kinds of ants that use sweet materials as an important part of their diet and the most important kind of sweet material that is naturally available is honeydew to many of these ants and honeydew is often produced by aphids. So you will see an aphid colony tended by ants and this is a, an association where there is going to be some benefit between both the honeydew producing insect, the aphid, and the ant. It's a mutualistic relationship. So what is happening is the aphids are feeding on the phloem. They're excreting this waste material, this honeydew, and the ants collect this. This is an important part of their diet. The ants in return will provide some sort of protection. Aphids are very poorly defended by themselves, essentially non-defended, and ants will protect them. Uh, so they can also protect their source of honeydew. So say a, uh, uh, an aphid uh, was uh, feeding on, on a, a plant, you might see ants tending it, in this case, uh, collecting the excreted uh, material as it's produced, the little droplets of honeydew, and then this would be returned to the colony of the ants. In return, the ants would provide protection against some kind of potential predator, in this case an ant trying to drive off a lady beetle. Uh, that is trying to feed on the aphids. So it is not uncommon for us to see some kinds of problems with aphids in a garden that result from uh, not the ineffectiveness of, of natural enemies by themselves but because they've been actively interfered with by ants. So sometimes the problem is uh, with an aphid problem in a garden is that ants are, are ag aggressively defending the aphids so that the natural enemies can't get to them. And if we were able to get rid of the ants, maybe put some sticky material around the base of the plant so the ants can't get on it, that would allow the uh, lady beetles, the flower flies, the lace wings to get on that plant and, and then control it naturally. But uh, uh, natural control of aphids can be thoroughly disrupted by aphids, uh, excuse me, by ants tending their aphid uh, uh, hosts for uh, that are a, a food resource for them. Another thing that aphids may do is curl leaves. Now this only happens if the leaves are young uh, and it doesn't happen with all aphids or all plants but some uh, aphids can produce curling of new growth of some kinds of plants and we see this a lot with trees and shrubs but we also see it with some of the uh, fruits and vegetables we, we wish to grow. So this can only occur during new growth. So green peach aphid, referring 
back to this insect we've talked about multiple times. Uh, this is a quite important insect outdoors in stone fruit production, particularly peach and nectarine and apricot, where it will be a chronic leaf curler in the spring in many parts of the state. Uh, and oftentimes growers may wish to inter intercede to prevent this kind of injury from happening. So that's a that's an insect that can often curl leaves of its associated host plants. Uh, plum, various kinds of plum have, have various kinds of aphids associated with them too in particular and sometimes they can uh, curl leaves quite intensively. Cherry, uh, the tart cherries uh, in particular are often associated with black cherry aphid. Now the leaf curls associated with that aren't nearly as tight but the aphid is pretty conspicuous. It's uh, quite dark, quite conspicuous, uh, so that people notice it uh, very often uh, in spring before they move to their summer host, which usually occurs in late June. Current, if you're growing some of the currants, uh, particularly red lake type of current, you have an aphid I guess I would call a leaf curler. It, it causes more of a puckering. It doesn't call a, cause a really tight leaf curl, but it causes a fairly dramatic uh, kind of uh, leaf color change. And it can be also present on some of our vegetable crops. So asparagus aphid is uh, an insect that is only associated with asparagus and it would produce a kind of leaf curl of asparagus. Uh, asparagus grows as a, a fern, so what you get is a, a dense tufting of the fern growth if you have asparagus aphid. And another one that I personally have had a lot more experience with in my own garden is one that I see causing a twisting and a tufting on dill and sometimes parsley. Uh, and that is a, a kind of insect uh, that I've uh, chronically had in the past. It is the carrot willow aphid, but it is an insect that I no longer personally have in my garden because I happen to have done something several years ago that got rid of this issue, uh, at least uh, uh, locally. And and this gets into a way that we might manage them, which I call the subject of double or nothing pests, and it would involve an aphid uh, that is one of these two host species uh, that requires two hosts to complete their development. So both need to be in place. We're talking about ones that have holocyclic life cycle, so they're going to alternate hosts between something in the summer and something in the winter. And in this case, my leaf curling aphids on my dill and my parsley, that's the uh, uh, carrot willow aphid. Uh, so in the summertime, it's a problem in my garden on those kinds of, of garden plants. Now, what did I do to uh, get rid of this problem? Is that I got rid of a willow tree that had been in my yard which is the required winter host. Certain kinds of European willows are the uh, required host for this insect. I removed it as part of a house remodel. The winter host was no longer available in my yard, so it could not complete its development. So this is something that we may consider in some cases of aphids, uh, these ones that have two uh, hosts, uh, to avoid plantings that allow them to complete their life cycle. Finally, uh, I want to touch on briefly the issue of aphids as vectors of viral diseases. Some viruses can be transmitted from plant to plant by aphids. Uh, not a lot of them. Uh, bean common mosaic, potato virus Y, cucumber mosaic, watermelon mosaic. Uh, these are examples of some viruses that are transmitted from plant to plant. None of these are common and important in regional gardens. Uh, they are important to some growers, particularly potato seed producers, uh, might be worried about potato virus Y. But most of these viruses are, are more important elsewhere. I, I want to talk about insects that are transmitting pathogens uh, later, next week, and there are, are some very important pathogens insects transmit, but they're not aphids. The thrips transmit important uh, pathogens. The leafhoppers do as well. And if we are talking about a, an aphid transmitted virus, uh, almost all of them are what we call non-persistent viruses. And 
this is a virus that is one that an aphid can pick up by simply probing. These are these are viruses that tend to be on the epidermal cells of the plant. An aphid probes, makes a little feeding probe, and if it feeds on an infected cell, acquires some of the virus. And then if it moves to the next plant, they can then uh, 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 essentially burp it out, uh, a bit of the saliva with a, a bit of the uh, particles, and infect the next plant. It does not enter the, their body and move internally within their body, as some other viruses do. Uh, they're transmitted uh, fairly uh, simply by then probing the next plant. It's just maintained in the foregut and then regurgitated out the next time. Called non-persistent because usually they can only transmit a virus in the next feeding probe or maybe the second one but the the virus is usually lost within a couple of minutes after they've acquired it and almost all the aphid transmitted viruses are transmitted in this way but again there's very few aphid transmitted viruses that are a problem in this part of the country other insects are more important as virus vectors but this whole issue of the ability of aphids to transmit a virus very quickly I think is well summarized by a poem that is was produced by my favorite teacher of all time Alan Peterson at the University of Minnesota called Ode to an Aphid and it goes like this so thou tiny little pest alighting on my plant to rest how can my mind be at ease when I think you carry some disease alas you hold your stylet steady and now begin to probe already. I'd like to swat you, little one, but your dirty work's already done. The bottom line of those last uh, uh, sentences are that these are viruses that are transmitted almost instantaneously, and were you to swat it or try to use an insecticide, uh, these would be in ineffective. Uh, these, the, the, the aphid transmitted viruses are, are transmitted so rapidly that uh, one will not uh, get a uh, a, a good uh, result from using insecticides alone. You have to really manage these in a way that prevents the aphids from even landing on the plant or better yet not being able to find a source of the virus to transmit to the plant. So these are usually managed by area-wide uh, sanitation to remove viral sources or ways to keep the, the aphid from landing on a plant. And, and one of the best ways of, of preventing them from landing on a plant would be to disturb the background uh, surface so that they, uh, the landing cues are disrupted. And, and in, in the previous class, I briefly mentioned the idea of, of mulches that are reflective, that, that reflect the uh, uh, light rays that uh, would then give the aphid or other insect attempting to land uh, confusion in the kind of signals it's getting. So these are, are sometimes used to prevent transmission of aphid transmitted viruses and can be far more effective than insecticides, which are essentially ineffective in these situations.